let us start the subject of prosperity with a little background and the background is that in one of her conversations the mother mentions that she would often meet people who would tell her that uh, we want to lead a spiritual life but uh, we are caught up in the web of material life even now this is one of the common refrains that one hears that yes we want to lead a spiritual life but uh, what to do our whole time goes into just taking care of our our own needs family needs uh, whatever goes by the name of needs so the mother says that i always felt that if i have an opportunity i would like to create a space where people can come and where the need for progress will uh, take priority over their material desires and uh, satisfaction of pleasure this, this we see even in the the original charter of uh, the mother the dream a dream in fact this dream divine series i felt inspired by that a dream that each aspect of the dream we can take up so she she says that uh, during the period what is normally known as the middle of one's life i got this opportunity i got the means and the opportunity to have such a place where people could come and they would live exclusively for progress and all their material needs will be taken care of that was the whole idea but this is in 60s but she looks back and she says uh, but my experience has been to the contrary she wanted to create a space where people can come they don't have to worry about the material needs and they can live and dedicate their life to the divine finding to the divine expression for progress at every level integral progress but she says that i have seen that uh, people were given freedom to explore because they are not now bound to uh, run the uh, run into the machine or run be run by the machine into the everyday grind so they had the opportunity to grow they had the freedom to grow but she says freedom has uh, been replaced by or rather licentiousness has taken the place of freedom people didn't understand freedom freedom is freedom to grow and progress <laughs> freedom is not like i'll do whatever i feel like so this is what happened and because she says uh, there is everything that people need they end up committing stupidities then at the end she says but uh, i won't say that it was a wrong decision <laughs> so it was a decision prompted by a need in the unknown and it has been manifested but she says one thing is sure that it is not this that is the problem of humanity that they are caught in the web of work and the various challenges for material living and she says i am waiting for someone to prove to me the contrary so this idea that because we have to live for our material needs that we don't have the possibility of spiritual progress to sit quiet and meditate to contemplate to reflect to go within to read etc etc people have now the time say in an ashram life something similar works in oroville people have time people have the uh, their their needs are taken care of but it's not that people sit and read and contemplate and reflect and meditate i'm talking of the what happens most of the time and this mother's observation i don't know i have my observation is only about myself <laughs> so so this was the origin of this dream then something very interesting happened how the ashram evolved there never was any set plan okay people will come here so i must have uh, the Uh, resources and the money so how much money i will need how much i calculate to give this has not been this is important to understand because very often we crystallize everything into a hard way of life for example when she came uh, shobindo writes about it there were two kinds of disciples always there have been those who depended completely on the mother so they came whatever they had 
nothing was asked from them but it was understood so they gave whatever they had with them and in turn the ashram if we want to call it uh, that way of course the ashram had formed in a formal way or it was growing in a formal way so it took care of all the rest of the necessities this too kept growing because uh, it was never like a fixed plan okay let's make an ashram with all the departments everything now you are welcome <laughs> it in the ashram has never been like that so if we see that in the beginning because people had come they had given everything they had given on their own which was understood that well if you are living here and taking all the resources obviously you contribute it's uh, everything is not to be spelt out we often see in shurbindo and the mothers uh, there is a kind of um, subtlety of communication for instance they don't talk about uh, disciplining and training yourself it's understood as a normal human being uh, nobody has to teach us how to be courteous let's put a it's not something to be taught as a yogic in the yogic school because there is something much more that is required but he had to do that even for instance people at the gate he wrote that when people come you are the first point of contact and you represent the ashram so in all your dealings you have to remember that you are an ambassador who is representing the ashram when we go out when we meet interact with people they should ask who is your teacher who is your master and they should ask this with a sense of awe and wonder where have you learned these things it should not be like who is your teacher who has taught you <laughs> not that it is the teacher's fault but that's how they they have not spelt out many things but people as things evolved as things happened we see number of letters which give us an indication of how the life evolved in the beginning of the ashram there was no rule and there never has been a rule proper rule so to say and when people insisted that uh, we need some rule after all so from one of the letters of shirbindo they made it into a rule which was given to people i think it was 30s mid 30s if i am not mistaken when people were given okay this is the rule you have to follow what is the rule always behave as if the mother is looking at you for indeed she is always present even that got distorted into the human mind looking at me means she is watching over me human mind tr translates everything in its own way it's such a beautiful thing see how the human mind distorts everything always behave as if the mother is looking at you it's such a sweet feeling that she is looking at us she is watching over us so beautiful oh she is looking at me she is seeing what i am doing what i am not doing and the whole thing gets uh, distorted human mind has this penchant for distorting everything this was the rule people were given freedom to do as the would but it was understood it was implied that this is a yoga bhumi even when you read the ashram trust document it came much later 55 and the reason was that uh, today is 1st november so we know 54 it was transferred the jew day when it the pondicherry was transferred to the government of india so the trust was formed in 1955 and it was very simple logic was very simple that now all the property was in the name of mother she is a unique dual citizen so there may be problems so they had to have for the material management people who could take care of the material property it had to be transferred to the name of certain people and that's on 1st may 1955 we see that the ashram trust was formed how does it start it it starts by saying that the shurbindo ashram is for those who have faith in the teachings of shurbindo it starts by that so everything is not necessary to be spelt out it's a yoga bhumi it's meant for those who want to take up yoga so that's where the every aspect of ashram life comes in but nobody can compel us it's something which is your, our inner calling and only we see hints and suggestions and the way the ashram life got organized so when we look at the ashram life the way it started getting organized it was to teach and train in a very beautiful way and a simple way because the mothers work 
she says by her own statement is to give a concrete form to Shurabindu's teachings. So Shurabindu has said always behave as if the mother is looking at you. Very nice, people forget. So when we look at the ashram life, it started in the morning with balcony darshan. Six o'clock. People would get up, they would want to be there and have darshan of the mother. And then there was vegetable darshan, the flower darshan, <laughs> cow darshan. Not that the holy cow was, but you know, she would see all the care of the animals, everything from her, people learned by example. And that's why I feel that one wants to understand yoga, one should read how the mother and Sri took care of everything. Yoga cannot be taught by books or simply by reading philosophical uh, treatises. So, in a concrete way, she showed many things. And then the day would finally close. She would go to departments, teach things, simple things like even how to wash the plate. So, one of the sadhaks uh, would show that, you know, uh, how do you wash? So, he started showing. He said, no, no, this is not the way. Start from the center and go to the periphery so that, you know, you don't carry the dirt back. Uh, Mahasaraswati is perfection. As a doctor, I can connect with it because this is the way I learned how to wash the hands in the operation theater. I said, oh wow, this is so wonderful. Mother has taught it like this. Because you don't uh, just casually wash it. You start, then let it drip so that, you know, the core elements are clean. And it gives also a hint for the yoga. If you start fighting with the peripheral elements of the yoga, one will be dragged in a battle. See how everything at every level she is. So it was the lesson for yoga. Start from the center. Remove the ignorance that is covering the soul. That's how Savitri gets the message for the yoga. Recover thy hid self. Find out thy soul. Then from there, it will start radiating, inner being, outer being, most difficult part, dangerous parts, like that. That's how the yoga proceeds. First step is discovery of the psychic being, rather than getting caught in all kinds of things. So in that process, naturally, there were two kinds of disciples, as I said. One who came, who wanted to be part of the ashram. They were taken care of by the mother. They gave everything. And there were others who lived outside. Even in Pondicherry, they had their own uh, work, they, they were running and it was up to them if they would offer it something to the mother, but yet they were doing the yoga. The only difference was that the mother, it's understood since they are arranging everything for themselves, they take care of them themselves. For instance, if they have a medical issue, food, everything they are taking care of. And... Um, these who had joined, they were taken care of entirely by the ashram. Nalli has put it very beautifully. He says, some she ties with a golden chain. So golden chain is where, you know, inwardly you are connected with her. All over the world there are people who are turned to her, who are connected with her. But on some she puts an iron chain. Now, you know, iron chain means they are held by her. Your mind, claimed. You can't break these chains and go anywhere. So there was definitely a difference between those who were earning by themselves and spending the money as they felt like and those who were on the ashram prosperity. They gave what they had and they received what the mother gave. This was a very beautiful training which the human consciousness can receive. And very interestingly it was called prosperity. Now if you wonder why it is called prosperity. <laughs> So, why not simply uh, need or some other thing that, you know, uh, daily or monthly requirements? No, the department is called prosperity. And the reason for it, prosperity, is it is opposed to austerity. So, it was not that we have to cut and stifle. There was the famous example of somebody who was lying on a mat, uh, who used to lie on a mat and put a brick below the head. Uh, thinking it's yoga and one day he got nice Mahakali's uh, <laughs> rap. <laughs> so, so normally we uh, imagine that, you know, to lead a spiritual life, we have to lead a life of austerity. Austerity is required. The mother speaks about four austerities. 
But if you notice very clearly in that austerity, the aspect of money, your daily requirements is not mentioned. She uses the word prosperity. So what is prosperity, how it was in those beginning, early days? Early days on the first of every month, people would give their chit, they would send it through somebody to the mother and the mother would uh, provide it in the beginning. In Auroville context, it was even for those people in the village who were taken up. And the mother had even said they should be given whatever they asked for. For a few months, later on it was based on uh, how they looked at it. But that's how she, she would accept and then she would, first of the month, uh, they would give. She would uh, give whatever is required for people, each one. And basically it included toiletries and simple things like uh, towel, uh, some dress or dress material. Ashram had a tailoring department. That's what it was. What about the medical need? It was taken care of because always the ashram had some doctor or the other and a kind of mini dispensary. Because there are many other needs which may arise from time to time. Food was taken care of by the dining room. So we must understand that this prosperity did not include these things. It was understood. Then also in the early years, some two rupees were given to people. This is something many people nowadays don't uh, connect with or understand. So she used to give some money because people may need two rupees at that point of time, thirties. It's, it's a bit, she understood that people need. Now this was a kind of baseline. Now why it is not austerity? It was not that people were forced, you live like this. Very gently sometimes when people started taking more and more, people went to any extent. For instance, there was a sadhak in whose room when the mother went, she found that it was stacked up with soaps that were coming from prosperity. So she asked, what are you doing? What are these soaps doing here? He said, no, no, I have a quota every month. So I take my quota, but I don't need. So I stack them. So the mother didn't say anything to him, but she is making a remark that, you know, uh, there are people who are very misers and people who like to hoard things, but they must know that these things should circulate. So one of the first lessons she gives, which we find in when she describes the prosperity flower. So where, where does prosperity come? When you give, prosperity comes. And it is true of outer and inner prosperity. You keep, try to hoard things, keep it to yourself after a while, all forces they need to circulate. Uh, the other day we were reading something from Collected Works of the Mother, Volume 2, where she said you should become like channels, you should let it flow. And she has even used uh, another um, flower which is called unselfish prosperity. And that, there she gives a comment, receives in abundance and gives it freely. So, this was one secret about prosperity. Prosperity also implies the very meaning of the word in English and in Hindi, interestingly, is it implies that it's not only outer but also inner. So she would give the outer prosperity. Many of the people, we know that took it with uh, it, its mother's touch. That's what mattered. Uh, I, I know even when I came, I didn't eat anything but I said I want at least one soap from the ashram to keep it as a... <laughs> Just as a, like, she has given. But then, there is another way to look at prosperity, which I, at least in my life, I, uh, I have shared this experience. But long back, one I had read, uh, I'm sharing this because, you see, there are, as the yoga evolves, there are many new possibilities. So, I used to feel that I am um, not in the ashram. I am working outside. So, how to live? as if I am in the ashram. Home atmosphere you have created. What about other things? So I had said that, okay, uh, the Gita also says, yoga shim vahamya, meaning thereby, uh, you do the yoga and I will do take care of your, all your needs. Uh, and this is what the mother has said also, that uh, she has said in a different way, you do my work, I will do your work. That's what Dhuman Bhai also asked, asked her for. So um, I had in my mind this long back, almost in the beginning, maybe 40 years back, uh, that, okay, not 40, 35 years back, I'll not buy anything for myself. As such, I didn't feel any need of anything. 
I said, I won't buy anything and I leave it to her. If, uh, if I need it, it will come. Uh, so, uh, Kavita, my wife, she told me, no, 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 it won't work like that. Okay, I'll tell you what all you need. I said, you may write, but I don't think I need. But anyway, she wrote things, strange things. I'm sharing this experience because you know how uh, the whole thing works. So, she wrote three pants and um, shoes and God knows what all. I said, this is not the uh, right way of, you know, doing it <laughs> because I don't need. I said, no, no, let's see. So, I said, okay, if I need these things, they will come. So, we, we went out on a trip. We didn't, I didn't buy anything, didn't even go to a shop. And people gave those things that at the end, they were in, on the list, 20 things, too many. And everything was there, including three pant pieces, combination coat. Somebody gives a combination coat. <laughs> Shoes, nobody in India, uh, it's not considered nice to give a shoe to somebody. And I got a shoe, everything. And then at least she was convinced. From that day I decided I won't buy anything for myself. Whatever I need, it will come. And it comes much more than what is needed. In fact, it becomes a problem that you have to now, uh, you have to understand that you are a trustee and you have to just give it to the right person. You just can't give it away. So there is another level at which prosperity operates. And there are a lot of people who are um, living on their own, outside and everywhere. And basically it is to live that whatever is needed will come to me, the mother will give me. And if it doesn't come to me, it means it's not either needed or there is something I need to learn. This is a very simple lesson that um, what we really need is very little. So basic, another idea of prosperity was that it's need, not desires. Not that I'll accumulate so many things people have, they love to do and nowadays uh, you know, on one side there is a lot of depression and then there is treatment, uh, Amazon.com and Flipkart.com. So it keeps balancing. You buy, you get uh, happy, then you get depressed and then again you go through a seesaw and swing. So this idea that we are not living a life for satisfaction of desires. So the human consciousness was trained through these things. That be happy with what you receive. You are receiving from the divine. It's something so beautiful. Just this idea. And the mother, the beauty is that she showed the way. There is an instance where during the Second World War, we know there was a lot of problem. The whole world was having a financial problem. And it had an occult dimension. We'll touch upon it in a moment. So in, in this whole world, there was uh, economic problem. Crisis was going on. So in ashram also, uh, normally they would get plain, dal, mostly watery. And sometimes they would have uh, some vegetable floating in it and people would say, ah, this is today, it is very special. And now, of course, we get sweets and everything, but otherwise it was like, ah, today we had some vegetable floating in it. So, during those times, it was very difficult and uh, there are two very beautiful touching instances of uh, examples that we should follow. So, allied to prosperity is the idea that do not waste things. Do not waste energy, it applies at all levels. So, Champaklalji used to, uh, when, when soaps, you don't use soap right to the end. So, he would keep those little pieces and during the Second World War, he got all those pieces. Mother, you can use it, we can make soaps out of it and use it. And she, it's such a touching incidence and she was so happy that uh, smallest details, just imagine. And the other was, uh, someone uh, said, I don't need a brush, but <clears throat> give me that brush and uh, from my side I would like to give to the mother because she may not have a brush. Uh, who will <laughs> look after prosperity for her? So the person passed the brush to her, say, offered the brush to her. She returned back, she said, you give it to the store because uh, I, have, I know this problem and I have found the way and for the last four months I used my finger. And I am very comfortable <laughs> with it. <laughs> I think it was in this context to give a lesson to all of us that how, really speaking, we don't need that much as we really believe it to be. And she narrates uh, it in the form of a story that uh, there was a discussion going on on how much do we really need. And one person can said that, well, I think most of the things we can do away with uh, maybe 
except for a toothbrush, of course. <laughs> she said he had not come to India, otherwise he would have known that even that is dispensable. <laughs> of course you need clothing, you need something simple, nice, dec decent enough. So the whole idea of prosperity was that needs and desires. It is an exercise in its own right. And I know it can be very... Um, um, what shall I say? Okay, let me say it openly. It can be very taxing if you are living, uh, if you are married or if you are living with someone where you keep questioning, is it need or is it desire? You have the means to buy it, to get it, but you want to see whether you really need it or it's a desire that is coming in you. It's a tremendous training for the vital being in us. Also, it teaches us equanimity. So, this idea whether I am buying things, getting things out of need, so when we look inside, then we see that we need very, very few things. And uh, people have even asked strange things to her. Because as I said, prosperity implies at every level. People have gone, I, I, I don't think I can uh, say what all people have asked. And said, I don't want this. I want, okay, I'll give one example. Said, I don't want prosperity, mother, because outwardly things are there. I want your blessings. Literally, see this double sense of prosperity, inner and outer. Every month, he would get, mother would write on a chit, blessings and sign it and give it to the person. Every month, she didn't say, no, 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 I am asking you to write something material, nothing. She understood that the person needs blessings. And she kept giving blessings with her signature. So when we look at uh, one of the first things that prosperity teaches us th is that, one, it is not only material, wealth is at every level and this too much preoccupation with material needs and so-called needs and desires is no doubt de detrimental to spiritual progress. There is no doubt about it because we are too much focused upon it. So, she comes back to this idea that people in the world say, no, we had no time. No, they have time. But they are sucked in a whirlpool where... Money, more money, more money and that's how things are. But if we really look at it that how much do we need, we don't need so much. But the problem is that then people become lazy. They, they don't progress. They don't care because most of the people are working so that they can look after their life's needs. But you need time to progress. So that's why here she took care that okay, you're not living for desires but progress is important. So everything for progress was provided, has been provided in abundance. So this is the other part of it. The second idea which is very interesting about prosperity is, very indirectly she hinted at it. That uh, not in exactly these words, but that yes, you may put it like that when somebody asks that you are trying to solve the problem of poverty. She said you may put it like that. Now, How is the problem of poverty connected with prosperity? If we really look at the problem of poverty from a spiritual point of view, it's a mismatch, an imbalance. There are stocks somewhere and there are holes at other places. This is enough for everybody as someone has said. But human greed, so there are people who, as Shovino puts it like that, when people um, give a little extra from what they have, it is like a robber satisfying his conscience. So... <laughs> by giving from what he has robbed. So that there is this aspect that there is plenty, much more than plenty, which people keep transmitting to their family, etc. That's why we see in Auroville something very beautiful. Uh, this uh, system, hereditary, property going by heredity, all this is not in tune with a new world and a new thought. And even it's illogical because, frankly, uh, is the child uh, you have nurtured, uh, so incompetent that you need to earn money and leave for the child. Uh, if, you, if you need to do it, then you have to doubt how you have brought up the child. So all these aspects were that in ashram, when there were a handful of people or a group of people, or in any place like Auroville, when people understand that we are going to live uh, or take what we really need, it is going to uh, set a new balance in the world. We don't understand about Auroville. She said it's an occult action. And how it's an occult action? One of them is this. When there are people who can, you're not stopped. I think in, you can pick up, you can pick up more. But you uh, don't want to pick up more because you feel you don't need it. 
Now, if few people do it, it has a cascading effect. So, this was the other aspect. And if there are enough people who can understand this, it's a very big problem because money has a strong grip on the human consciousness. Wealth, power, position, sexual impulse, they have very strong grip on the human consciousness. They don't live easily. But if there are people who can do it, that I live according to the needs. And one step further, whatever I need, the mother will provide to me. Now, people often think that, uh, how can it be today? But as I said, and that's why I gave this example, at least in my life, I have seen that for the last 35 years, it has been like that. Everything that I have needed and three times more. Mother herself gives this example. She says that uh, when she was a child of 15, she didn't have any desire to buy this, to buy that. And she had a pair of shoes. But like a young girl, she would want the shoes should look good and they should look new. So how she, because sense of beauty is there. So how she managed it. So every time the shoes will get worn off from one side or something or the other, she would put a lacquer paint over it. And then the shoes would look new and at the end of the day, <laughs> they looked completely new because she had painted it. So uh, she says that, you know, that's how she lived. One day, she had this wish when she looked at a petticoat. I wish I had this. She says the next day I received them as gifts, not one, not two, not three, but five. So it is true that when we, uh, we don't live a life of desire, very often people think that how will things come? They will come because this is how it is. And when we live for the sake of the divine, when we give ourselves to the divine, uh, even passingly this thought should not occur that who will look after me? Because even a good human being, I am not even saying extraordinary human being. A person who is humane enough will look after those who take care of him or do their work. The divine takes care at so many levels, every level. And as I said, on the other side, how much do I really need? Well, at the same time, in the ashram context, there were very strange things that happened. So there was a gentleman who, so ashram when the eggs were being given, they were stamped from the they are ashram eggs. So, there was somebody who was selling those eggs. <laughs> now imagine, not only eggs, they are stamped ashram eggs and he is selling them. So, this matter was reported to the mother. First thing she said is that, well, you, uh, you know about it, you have told me, you don't have to bother about it. Don't look what people are doing. So, this was one part. That you don't uh, engage yourself in what people are doing and not doing. This was a um, one of the ways the community life had to thrive. If you start looking at other people's faults, it's impossible. And it's logical, common sense. Anybody with a little developed inner being would understand. And especially here, we have to look into ourselves. So she used to say that, don't, um, uh, okay, I am, I am aware of it. And there were many such instances where somebody would report, I have seen him doing so and such a thing here, there, where. She says, you have seen it? That's it. Now forget about it. It's not your purpose. Next time, when you pass by his room, don't look into his room. This was a solution. <laughs> but at the same time, she said something very strong and powerful. She says, people who receive things from the ashram, uh, and when they sell it, then this is an insult to the divine and it has severe spiritual consequences. It brings its own spiritual consequences. But there is a bit of severity in the tone. It brings its own spiritual consequences. Now, you see, say in our will context, we are supposed to give whatever you know you earn from a unit and people may not do that. We don't have to worry, they have to worry. It's a serious thing because your conscious and I am aware of at least a couple of instances where the consciousness is becoming more and more dense. So divine justice is like that. You cut yourself off from the divine. You had such a wonderful opportunity. That's how I see when, you know, in the ashram context or I'm talking of the collective life, See, it's such a wonderful opportunity that all of us have, which, uh, I mean, uh, I would say that there can be nothing greater than this. 
to be to know that there is a purpose to life to start with to be called towards something higher and greater and more beautiful than just leading a life of uh, the routine uh, bourgeois life if i may call it <laughs> at least there should be the life of a samurai outside but anyways and then on top of it to to know that there is a higher goal goal of spiritual evolution there is a luminous future for the earth to be called for that to be chosen for that i think nothing more one would really ever ask for this is the ultimate that one has got and then if we do not take that opportunity so every opportunity comes with a, a there is a what shall i say footnote if you are not given an opportunity it is okay <laughs> but when you are given an opportunity and you lose it that's where shobindo says that the hour is often terrible and then there he says that thrice go to those who are strong and ready yet waste the force and lose the moment so in yoga there is nothing which is external like an outer control if you try to do it there is we have missed the principle of yoga if you control very hard yes mothers sometimes would say why are you asking more and there were there were there are instances for instance there was someone who was very unpleasant uh, time to time and whenever people would go to ask something he would ask very unpleasantly all kinds of questions so this person decided from now on i am not going to take prosperity so mother said what kind of a response is this she said it 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 is something like if you go to the dining room and the person who is at the counter does not behave well you will say i'll not come to the dining room or if you go to the ashram and at the gate somebody is very rough this actually happened in front of me somebody got into an argument at the gate and came i don't want to enter this ashram so he came out i was there i said hold on hold on hold on why have you come to the ashram said, no no i don't know i said see you have not come here to <laughs> that man <laughs> to discuss with him debate with him what should be what should not be go inside have the pranam and then you come back don't get you know <laughs> uh, when you are going to a great uh, you know uh, what shall i say the greatest uh, moment when you can be in such a close contact with the divine why are you throwing it away just because you don't like a human being don't like uh, his face so this happened in terms of prosperity also so she said i am giving the prosperity that person is only a channel he is not giving the prosperity this idea that uh, it is that human being who makes me feel low makes me feel very small that means you are feeling insulted that means your ego is very active receive and use this as a double opportunity if you don't allow yourself to be carried away by that emotion or feeling of oh he is insulting me he does not know who i am sometimes it happens you don't know who i am are you know who you are you discover that <laughs> you are not meant to be someone or something of the old world Uh, it's a great opportunity when people uh, you know suddenly say this i often say when you are coming to ashram sometimes they will ask get past this that and uh, you feel very silly you know to explain that i am from oroville which is mother's creation so what is there but well people are what they are but you should take it as well it's an ignorance people don't understand they are the people are small sometimes they don't um, they're not wide enough to understand that all this is the divine mother's great wonderful space so it doesn't matter smile and go there and sit with the mother so that's how in prosperity she would say at the same time at another level she she would uh, uh, you know when somebody would ask why do you need it so the person wrote to the mother that uh, uh, i don't like it from now onwards i will write to you directly whatever i need she says no no it's me who has put him there and the questions that he is asking it is perfectly fine because it's his work to ask so you see it's it's a uh, it doesn't operate in a very straight and simple manner when we try to especially mothers ways when we try to turn them into a fixed rule take another very simple example of uh, you know now this is about prosperity was about your everyday need but it includes everything your way of life the way you are living so there are people um, i know at least of one person whom she gave a big uh, house 
almost a bungalow to stay. Person is alone. Logical mind would say that uh, that place should be for somebody with a big family. And to someone else, uh, there would be just a little room. So this inner need of each one, she knows and she, we, have, we can express it to her and then leave it to her. So the whole idea of prosperity was to receive everything from her and to express all our needs to her and leave it to her whether she will grant it or she will not grant it. There is a very nice little, uh, small little passage in the synthesis which at least to me has served as a kind of uh, beacon light. Because initially when somebody would give me a gift uh, and I felt I don't need it, so I would say no and I, I would very much hesitate. I won't take it. And then the person once stumped me by saying, uh, you have got rid of the ego of the giver, but you still have the egoism in receiving. And I, I said, <laughs> maybe yes, that is true. And then I contemplated on that and I remembered something very beautiful that we see Shubhinda writes in the synthesis. Whatever the gift and to whomsoever you give, and it equally applies to whatever be the gift and from whomsoever you receive, you should know that it is coming from the divine and it's going to the divine. Even if the person refuses it, she goes on to say, you have given a gift to somebody and the person refuses it, still the divine has accepted it. When something has come from someone and you take it, the divine has sent this to me. Why? I don't know. It, you have to use it rightly, divinely, the right way. That's your uh, sadhana, that's your yoga. And it comes, so that's how we have to live with this idea that things come from the divine. It applies at every level, to the level of a human relationship. He says, what is love? Love is a vibration from the one going to the one in another person. So you have to know that the divine in you loves the divine in the other person and it cannot be an intellectual concept because every time the person gets angry, you will be hit. That time you have to remember, it is to the divine. This is surface personality, it means nothing. If the person in the outer personality is angry or um, even insults you, doesn't understand what you are doing, you have to understand this is a surface personality. The divine presence is there inside, connect with that. And this is the way we have to look at the whole life that it is a trans transaction taking place in this whole universe. Who is the sole originator? The divine. Who is the sole recipient? It's the divine. And when we look at the entire interchange that is happening in this world, material, emotional, vital, all the interchange of forces, of which money is a concrete symbol in the vital level. That's how Sri explains about money. Now, money is different from prosperity. So, then life becomes very simple to be connected through the one. So, whatever comes, we receive like that. Whatever our needs, he says, you should express to the divine. What can be expressed to the divine? Everything. Now, it doesn't mean that it will come only from one source. That is to put things in a very straight jacket, I feel. Because there are some very interesting instances. I must, one particular one where mother's action, when we try to put in a very straight jacket, in a very um, rule-bound, uh, rigid way, so there is a instance, there, there are a number of instances. One of them is, you know, people would give her some things of gold, gold brooch. One person who went to her, she suddenly took one of the gold brooches and uh, gave it to that person. Uh, she would give like that. It was not meant, it was not based on, uh, he was a rich man. It was not based on that, you are a poor man, therefore I will give this gold so that you can sell it. That's not the way we have to look at it. It carries the stamp of the Divine Mother and there is something which she has seen. So there are a number of instances, one particular I remember directly straight from the source and it was very touching. Uh, this lady came and uh, she had a young daughter, she had lost her husband and she came with all the ornaments and uh, she put it in a bundle and gave it to the mother. So mother um, smiled and she held it and she said, no, you keep it. He said, no mother, what will I do? I am here with you, whatever I need, you are there for me. Then mother said something very interesting. See, at practical levels, how she understood every level of human nature. 
So she would, uh, she said, see, your daughter is right now very small. When she grows up, you would want to get some things for her. So when she uh, needs something, will you be able to ask it from dash, 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 from the ashram, whoever the authorities are? She said, no, <laughs> that I cannot do that. So I am telling you, you keep it now from me. You are given to me. I am giving it back to you. There are strange instances. One of them I know is, why I am saying is there is a very wide connotation of this because there are many things that happen which don't come into this bracket. So, uh, Chutnarayanji, his son, when he was getting married, the mother sent one of her very uh, expensive saris which somebody had gifted to her to give it for the daughter-in-law who is going to enter into the house. She would do many things like that which people recount. So this uh, one is prosperity in the limited way that you have your monthly needs, you give it and uh, what it implies is that we should not be driven by desire which is understood actually anybody who uh, really seriously seeks the spiritual life, the first lesson is uh, don't live for desires. Uh, don't live just for satisfying the pleasure sense. It's understood. This, this is a basic thing. It need not be specified, but Sri Aurobindo and the mother has specified it several places and it's known in all traditions. Living for desire, living for ego aggrandizement means I'm not serious about spiritual life. Then who is the loser? I am the loser. Not that anybody will turn me away or turn me out. Everything in spiritual life is a practice to train the ego self, to train the desired self, to tame it, to teach it, to subordinate it. So all experiences come like that. This is the minimum. Second level, all comes from the divine and all must go back to the divine. How to go to the divine? When we have, say, things like money, we have little extra, use it in the right way. It should go to the right person or in the right work. And that right work, nowadays we have plenty of work all over the world or even in the house. Someone once asked if I want to make my house a little more beautiful. Of course, beauty is, is an aspect of the divine. Money is meant to... Uh, be used in, in external manifestation. It's one of it's one of its roles. So in divine work, if if one knows that directly, it is best. So this is how money has to be used. It is meant to circulate. Third thing which we learn is that uh, anything in life when we hoard, it's not uh, good. Not only for that thing. She says it rots, and she says it is it it. Equally true of moral things. It rots. And uh, in olden times it used to say, they used to say that when you keep a lot of money and hoard it and stack it, then snake would come and there. What is that snake? Like the original worm of, uh, worm or snake of Adam and Eve. So, <laughs> so what is that snake? That snake, uh, one of the reasons why people get tumors, she says, is greed. When you want to hoard things, so... There is a spot where they get accumulated. I am not saying we should pass moral judgments on people when they have problems. But I am just saying that all this is to train us. That when you get things, unselfish prosperity receives in abundance and gives it freely. That's how she has described. A beautiful flower. Very fragrant. That's why it is prosperity. It is, its fragrance is so strong. I think one of the as far as I know, the strongest fragrant flowers. Just put one or two in the room and the whole room is filled with the fragrance. It just gives abundantly. It doesn't like... And then it gives it away fully. It gets dried up also very fast. So this is what... And, and how it receives. This is a very unique flower. It grows on the trunk. So it receives everything as if from the very core. And it makes everything full. So prosperity is about fullness. It's about abundance. It's about inner and outer wealth. Everything. So we have a choice between focusing on outer wealth or we have a choice on focusing on inner wealth. So when we focus on the inner wealth, outer wealth is taken care of. And yes, if we need it for the divine work, we should ask and we can ask. Sri says one should not hesitate and if you, if you ask, Shivinda has even said, when you ask, the giver is just by what he is, his response. You should not feel hesitant to, oh, I am asking money. 
If you are clear that it is meant for the divine work, there should not be any hesitation in asking. Actually, it's an opportunity given to the person who has plenty to part it painlessly so that he can avoid pain in the future, which may come because of holding it. It's a dravya yagya. So, some people, it, it is the other aspect of not prosperity directly, but sometimes with dealing with money, dealing with objects, things, wealth, one should not hesitate. Because this is how it is if it's for divine work. For all our needs, turn to the mother and tell her, this is what I need. Some people like to write in a diary and then leave it to her. She has said this. She has said that you can ask everything from me. This is the widest formula. Mother, what do you expect from us? Nothing. Mother, what can we expect from you? Everything. She has even gone to that extent. In fact, Sri Aurobindo says that uh, the child soul goes to the Divine Mother in all its difficulties and the Divine Mother likes it so that she can pour her heart of love. So, uh, normally people limit this prosperity to the first when the prosperity was given. But I'll give you another instance which was so beautiful. Vijay Bhai was recounting it to me. When he was seven year old, the mother had given him a cycle and you know, he was using it seven or eight, whatever. Then suddenly on his birthday, then on his twelfth birthday, uh, or I think it was twelfth, uh, suddenly in the playground, he is called, mother is calling you. He goes, what is mother calling me for? So mother has remembered that now that cycle would have grown smaller for him. So she has got a new cycle which is for his height and gives it to him. So you see at so many levels everything that one needs. So this typical prosperity of first is only for her monthly needs, hair oil. Of course, if we say no I want that branded hair oil, obviously it is desire. <laughs> That's where one has to um, remember it. And of course, there is so much which he gives freely. Uh, here, set up, I don't know, but in ashram, medicine and everything. I'll close with a little humorous instance. One of the persons, Mani Ben, Mani Ben Patil, who came as a young girl, I forget the age, 15, 16 year old girl. And she came along with all the aunts. So she was telling me, next day I went to the ashram and I saw on the board something was written. And I said, wow. You get it free. And it was written, spirit distribution free. She said, spirit is given freely. This is some magic. <laughs> so she took it. She really felt, ki, what does it mean? It's some kind of a magic formula that I'll get spirit freely. Free. I have to do nothing for it. <laughs> of course, it is true in a way because what do we really give in return for all that she gives us? But then she came to know that spirit, the spirit which is the spirit spirit, <laughs> that is given free, of course not to drink but to clean. So <laughs> this was, um, she has gone to any extent, for instance there is an instance of a, a disciple in the ashram, Dara. So Dara had a strange problem, he had many problems. One of them was smoking. So now he has given his money. What do he do? So she would get, uh, he would get a smoking allowance from the mother. So, why I am saying these things? That the principle should be understood rather than get stuck with a very external mode which evolves, which changes. Like initially even money was being given. And I see no reason why one cannot bring it back again. So initially she used to give money, two rupees per person, which is fairly good, 1936. And then depending upon as things evolved, changed, based on individual needs, now you can't do it because mind has a tendency to turn everything into a standardized formula. That's our idea of perfection. But that's not really perfection because perfection is something based on the evolution, your needs, your what really you need to evolve and your next level, your true needs and she gives everything. So the higher way of prosperity is to regard everything that one needs, one will get from the mother and take it that it is coming from mother. 
Treat it with respect, care, knowing that it's a gift. You are a trustee. It's with you today. It may go elsewhere today. And live with that attitude that all that comes, comes from the mother. And all that we need, we should tell her. So there is a prosperity chit, but also we should keep with us a little diary. Okay, let me close with one instance of this diary thing. So in Bangalore, there is a center which was very big. It was in Nepal Maharaja's place. And uh, um, uh, when suddenly I was asked to take over as secretary. And then I learned that the account is in deficit. So we had uh, 7,000 in the bank account and the immediate to be given was um, 12,000. It was a huge palace, all, you know, uncared for. And first thing you felt is that you have to take care. And this is 91 and 93, we had decided relics to, um, to, be, to come there. We didn't know what to do. There were two cows. Uh, so I started writing in a small little notebook. Uh, I put mother's picture and started writing. Uh, the Jersey cow's mother has given this much milk today, like that. Uh, this much money has come. This much to the gardener, like a meticulous accounting. Money started pouring from everywhere. And within one and a half years, everything had changed. It came. She sent people without asking. She sent the money. And we had wonderful relics installation and that place is um, the garden. Suddenly every, everything poured in. So when we use things in the right way, then they stay with us and they grow with us. And when we don't use it rightly, when we just want to hoard it or we waste it, particularly when we waste it, then it is taken away from us. It, it applies at all levels. So, along with prosperity, austerity goes together. What is austerity? I don't want to waste things. I want to use the forces or money or something, whatever I receive, in the right way for the right purpose. I don't want to throw it away. I take care of it. Mothers emphasize so much on taking care of material things. She says not to take care of them is a kind of inconscience. It means we don't understand that there is a divine presence in it. And see her prayer where she is... Uh, speaking about, you know, all the sweet little objects that have served her when she is moving away from France. So all this is the larger world of prosperity. It belongs to the divine. We are only its recipient. Today it is with us. Tomorrow it will pass to other hands. As it passes into other hands and as it is spent, let let world become a richer and more beautiful place rather than just holding it and keeping it. When it goes, it should go again as a divine impulsion to wherever it must go, where it will create more beauty in outer life and balance the needs of this world. What it suffers from is, as I said, it's an occult way of dealing with poverty, that there is an imbalance between those who need it and those who hold it. If that imbalance can be corrected, there is much more than enough in this world to distribute it. And all who give it as a enjoy and all those things, let me say that is not the way because it's satisfying the conscience of the robber as I was saying. The right way is to live in such a way that well, what I receive, it should go into making this world a beautiful place. And that is the larger context of prosperity. Okay. Uh, Jayma, any Anything, um, I mean, it's a very different kind of topic, <laughs> subject. <laughs> uh, if there is any particular specific question, I'll be happy to respond to. I think you have prosperity here also, no? Yeah. She has, I've seen her notes. <laughs> Why is there an imbalance? It might be a stupid name. Yeah, no, it's a correct question. Greed and desires. See, what happens with greed, some people want to accumulate more and more and more. And they are never satisfied. So it creates a hole somewhere. It's a, it's a question of distributing the wealth rightly. Auroville is, is one of the experiments of Auroville is that. So if we can manage it here in the best way, it will have repercussions on the world. Absolutely, it's because some people are greedy, some people are full of desires. Now, it's not that it is something right or wrong. 
The question is that it is not consistent with spiritual aspiration. That's all. If one wants to live to satisfy desire, the world is there and certainly one has a right to do what one wants to do, uh, whatever its consequences be. But a spiritual life means that yes, you need things, but desire is something else. Very simple test, desire and need. If something is taken away from you, if you get restless, it's a desire. If in summer there is no AC and you are getting restless, it's a desire. <laughs> and she takes care. I have gone through this, I mean, it's very interesting. And But if she thinks you need it or whatever it is, it will come. Because she wants, she divine does not want us not to be happy. She even said that about dining room when first time out of porcelain this, first there were porcelain plates, then somebody gave steel plates and oh so happy ma mother we have now steel plates, this is my child, I want my children to eat in gold plates. But the difference between eating in gold plates and owning a gold plate is what makes the problem. <laughs> so, so this is where the whole rub lies. So desire is everything that uh, if we think if I don't get it I become restless then it's desire. And it applies at every level. So, yeah. This thing of we get what we want, is it only like one who has taken the mother or is it for everyone? I mean, are the poor who are poor or hungry are hungry because they have to be or that's their need? Oh, that's a very interesting question about poor people. She has talking, spoken about it. So that's where we touch the occult link between inner and outer prosperity. If your inner consciousness is depraved, then either you will amass wealth in a very greedy way but never be able to enjoy it because inwardly there is utter poverty. You will have the money but your whole consciousness will keep degrading because you will use it for everything that you should not use it for. And I don't, don't want to even speak about the, the, those things. Casino is the, or whatever it is spelt as casino, that is the least dangerous. So it's a curse. That's how she said that having money is a curse when your consciousness is not right. That's why it is said that it's easier to make a camel pass through the eye of a needle as in the Bible than to make a rich man turn to God. And mother has said it is so very true. Or else when the consciousness is inwardly very uh, gross and crude, uh, depraved, then there is also outer poverty which is actually a greater blessing than... Uh, you snatch money like the Asura and Rakshasa because at least you will strive, you will struggle, you will try to do something, you will improve your condition. Also, uh, we should get rid of this idea and I am saying this with all uh, sincerity uh, uh, and practical experience as a young 15 year old driven by idealism, no, the poor must get money and playing the Robin Hood, all those things, but that's a different story altogether. So, you know, this idea that people suffer because they don't have money, no. There are instances I've seen people who come from very poor backgrounds who don't have money, but inwardly they are beautiful people. And I have seen the reverse also, but most of that people who don't have money, if you really interact with their consciousness, there is something very low and obscure. And the mother actually gives the example of uh, one girl whom uh, everybody took pity and you know, they took to, uh, one of the people took her also to France and tried to educate everything. She used to steal. So they thought that she is stealing because um, she doesn't have money. So they took care of everything <laughs> and she came back. But then even when she had everything, Given an opportunity, she would steal. See, this, uh, this problem of human nature is not, this oversimplification doesn't work. There are people who are poor, who don't, and I have plenty examples within the Indian setting, I see it every day. I mean, people who really don't have, they will return your purse back. Uh, I've had number of instances of poor people, so-called poor people in India. And some people say, oh, we need to help them. I said, no, you please help yourself. They, they are fine, who would uh, take care, that they, they would not take uh, extra from you. And they are not doing it in an ostentatious way that, you know, you are not like in a branded showroom, you are paying ten times more and 
obviously you can't haggle bargain they don't charge you extra but they don't they have already looted your both the pockets so i'm not talking of that so we must understand in this world there is a providence that operates in a very interesting way you have the experiences and as he says all your outer circumstances mother says i am convinced that they are there because of something which is inside so we have to look into that and we have to grow and that applies to money that applies to everything this is something which uh, one has to walk through the world with open eyes and one will see uh, i have seen it very uh, practically uh, giving money as a uh, young uh, air force officer giving money to everybody poor people this that so you see people drink they they get because they have not earned that so they don't know how to contain it and when they earn they grow there is a dignity of that they don't need to snatch money they need to grow through dignity this their law of evolution that's how indian society was organized at one point of time there were two people who were poor outwardly in indian society one who were the shudras okay the famous shudras who were who were uh, earning their livelihood through material uh, through physical work the other the brahmins who were never supposed to charge any money from anyone so all that they did was they went to a house this was the idea in the ancient ideal that you go to one house only one house and say bhiksham dehi if the person gives you whatever the person gives you you receive it and come back or else if the person gives nothing you come back you can't go to another house we have instances like that swami vivekananda going hungry two days so these were the two people who were poor but the difference was this person is going up the evolutionary ladder so he has to strive to get and the other has received knowledge which he must share freely and if somebody gave in return as a dakshina it was fine but he was never supposed to ask money so uh, this idea that money this is a, another way of making money the lord oh we need money oh this world needs money this world is suffering because of lack of money all about money this kind of you know uh, socialistic philosophy this deeply flawed this world is not suffering because they are deprived outwardly this world is suffering because of inner poverty and that is the first necessity so in the context of all of them ऑर्गेनाइज work is important without work it's not about uh, generating revenue when we work in oroville or the ashram we don't do so that we can get money for the department or for for oroville we do work as in offering as a uh, you know karma yoga if you want to put it like that of course karma yoga has a very wide ranging meaning but i am telling it in a limited way so what does it mean 6 hours when i am working in a department or whatever number of time now i'll have number of interactions which will hurt my ego or puff my ego and i have to be very watchful so it's not easy because when we are sitting alone and going within nobody is there to tell me except if there are mosquitoes and flies then but they will not know that you are getting disturbed <laughs> but when i am dealing with people uh, work implies that i will interact most of the work and it helps me to grow because it helps us grow in equanimity it helps us grow in true surrender it helps us grow in sincerity uh, when people keep blaming and complaining others when they keep looking at others judging others that means i have not taken the first step towards uh, the true inner growth so work is there at the same time the working life is organized in such a way at least i don't know you know how it works but in the ashram you have 6 hours of working but there is plenty of time corporate sector you see people are working for 10 hours 12 hours that's silly and stupid so what do they do then you have free time now in ashram you have place for physical development same is true in oroville you have spaces where you can just go and sit in quietude and go within the problem is and that's where one has to be people don't do that the time which is left that's where i started 
you work but it's not like all work and money work and money is corporate so what people do they are given time so that you can develop yourself and a little bit of leisurely time is required for growth shubhendra said that you can't be you can't grow if you are all the time involved in running about like a squirrel from here to there you need time to grow of course you need time to go within you need time to read you need time to contemplate you need time to stand and stare but uh, and she has given us all that but what happens is with the free time what do we mostly do that is for each one to answer we can chatter we can it's not that you don't uh, meet friends or don't talk to them but generally speaking most of the time it's just wasted so that's where the problem lies it's a right healthy balance it's work meditation bhakti all of them together and she has this space is created in such a way that you can do all of these you're not generating income for the department that should go away you do your work well income will come it may but it doesn't mean you will keep uh, fundamentally throwing the core of yoga out of the window to generate income some people do that but it's their business but equally in oroil when you have a unit you are running a unit you are the earner earning person then if i am not mistaken you are supposed to share voluntarily because the mother never liked to impose any rules i'm not talking of our context but there are people who have units which are they are earning they are having money so you are supposed to contribute voluntarily what happens when people don't contribute i am at least aware of somebody who doesn't do that who keep showing its losses but trans because why because it's uh, you can uh, some benefits are there now who is the loser as i said you are the loser the person who is doing it is the loser and he doesn't know what he is losing today he is earning but we in india believe in rebirth <laughs> so i don't need to say more there was example of a person who earned a lot of money from uh, um nigeria and came back to india in his 40s he goes stick puffed up as he described he said, i thought i have money what do i care about spiritual life this that and somebody came to ask him you have so much of money why don't you give some we want to create a one prastha ashram he said what nonsense one prastha ashram all this ashram this that you should earn money and so he said okay there is a talk of someone why don't you come and just listen so very hesitantly he went to listen so when he went that day the person was mentioning you know when we have money this life we have it we don't know what is going to happen in next life you may be born poor now that <laughs> struck him he said oh can i next life i may be born poor i have so much money now if i don't spend it rightly and wisely in the right way then who knows in next life i may be hit very hard <laughs> so he started a new journey with the money and he has ended up building a very beautiful complex i have been there uh, shurabindu dham it's a whole place on the bank of kaveri dedicated to first they started with a, a vridhrashram and gurukul followed by this place because then he turned to mother first he started with the arya samaj and then he turned to mother and then he said no i want only this so he used the money in such a beautiful way but that initial thing was i have it and i spend it the way you people don't know how to earn <laughs> so when we don't use see one life is nothing when we don't use something rightly when we are given an opportunity and we waste it then uh, i think it's the greatest loss that one can ever imagine much more than monetary loss so once you have taken a plunge do everything to remember the goal and keep focus what is happening to the left right go forward go forward ever forward amal kiran had added this to mothers uh, mothers written forward ever forward uh, one day he uh, i was there and he said don't look left don't look like right go forward he had learned his lessons very well <laughs> so <laughs> that's how yoga is done that's how and one has to understand one is here for the yoga nothing else all ideas idealisms all those things are there in the world religions rituals everything is there outside the world is meant for that but here it's a very special work 
for which one has been called or one has stripped into doesn't matter and so one has to uh, feel the joy and the privilege exceptional privilege what an opportunity to be called for this endeavor and just give oneself completely to that okay Beautiful ending, but I have one silly question more. Which is you can ask. In Portugal, when we have the Portugal government or fund, I mean, I don't know how it functions so much, but still, a lot of it comes from donations, and some of it comes from people wanting to develop the economy. But if all the money is coming from the divine, or should one focus on donations, or like people always think that don't stop? The divine is the source and he inspires people to part it's a privilege to them to part a little from what they have stolen from this world I am using this word <laughs> with all 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 uh, sincerity every time I somebody takes me to a branded store I know it is stealth okay so whatever it is so people are parting with it they have been given an opportunity it also comes from the uh, earning those who are donating, it's their privilege, if you ask me. So, even for this uh, big palace which I was mentioning, it was given by a Maharaja of Nepal. And I had removed all his photographs, everything, everywhere and just kept Mother in Shurabindo. So, people were a bit annoyed, they called him, he came and he asked me, um, um, there were some photographs here, I said, yes, I have kept it in the servant quarters, if you want it, I will give it to you. No, but don't you think they should be here? I said, no. He said, what about the person who has given it? I said, what a privilege. He has given to the divine, received from the divine. Where do I and your <laughs> photographs come in the way? So this is a work of the divine mother. We are not here to, uh, you know, glorify people who have donated, gifted. When somebody wanted to donate to uh, Golkun and like in many of these crude temples, you will see donated by so and so or on the bench donated by somebody so they said that the person is ready to donate money but he wants the his name written somewhere on one of these stones he said okay put it on the floor <laughs> another where someone sent for a one rupee and she went into a trance this was a person who had earned money all, almost you know in the train selling those chanachur and then she said, the divine will find it difficult to repay to this individual. And whereas at another instance, somebody gave 5,000 rupees, she struck it off, not accepted. A third instance, where a person gave money and also gave a list of what it should be used for. Gaushala and this and all that. So they asked Shirobindo, what do we do? He said, I accept the money, I reject the advice. So, you see, we have to understand it's a privilege to that person and money will come. If there is a need for the divine work, money will come. Nothing can stop. And if it is not coming, that means somewhere we have to see whether we are, as a group are sincere or not. If we are sincere, money will come. There is no doubt about it. There is a prayer of Sri Aurobindo, not a prayer. In 1927, when the ashram came into existence, 1926, November, in 1927, he writes two of his notings. They are notings which later on were discovered. One is where he writes on behalf of the mother, as the mother, I am the Shakti of Sri alone. Now this not, mother is not written, Sri writes, I am the Shakti of Sri alone. And second is, I am the God of wealth. Like that, this is a small noting. When Duman Bhai once um, was contemplating uh, how the money will come to run all these things and suddenly in his trance he was taken to Kuber's ab abode. And Kuber told all this wealth is there for the mother's work. When it is needed, truly it will come. And haven't we seen the mother during Second World War, they had very little. Mother didn't have a room to herself till 1954. What a path she has shown. She didn't have a room to herself. From France, she didn't want ACs. Later, much later, they put some AC and she was not fond of it. 
but she didn't have a room her room was also her where she rested was also her workplace so they have they, they have shown us the way 54 that too it was insisted upon mother no you take a room so she went through all this but see what happened later on how money has come for everything and it will come there will never be any and now with the super mind acting there will be people who will open and instruments will come and we don't have to worry where the money is coming from and i mean i know some people try to keep a tab and they i personally feel if you get into that it's a horror story wherever there is money and power take it for granted there is some problem <laughs> now those people who are involved in dealing with it it's their yoga as i said if they are not using it rightly thrice go to those who are strong and ready at waste the force there is a spiritual reward and a spiritual consequence for all we do and we are not there to render judgment over them or to punish i mean i personally am very clear on that there are people who do it all kinds of things everywhere ashram and orville will not be any exception you can't expect that people are doing everything the way it should be done but it's their business literally their business <laughs> and they should mind their business we should mind our business our business is to unite with the divine by giving ourselves completely to the divine if we have failed in that business then we have failed in what we are here for okay thank you jai